And we're here to, to celebrate these various anniversaries and to learn from the people who are going to be speaking and talking with us tonight. There are very many rich traditions in indigenous communities and other communities where knowledge, theories of knowledge are different than what occurs primarily in the academy in this country that thinks about theories of knowledge emerging from and with community values and community traditions and in service of those communities. So we're here to learn tonight uh, from the presentations and then to engage and participate in building new kinds of relationships and new kinds of co uh, conversations that can truly make a difference in this country and across the world. I also want to thank the Action Research Special Interest Group of the American Education Research Association uh, for co-sponsoring this event uh, and their, the chair of their program, Lonnie Rowell, who helped to organize and sponsor this event tonight. I believe there's a number of participants here who, ha who are gathering uh, over the weekend for a meeting of the American Education Research Association who have taken some time to come out here uh, to support uh, the, the conversations and to participate in those conversations and to learn from them. So thank you all for coming. Um. <laughs> So we also want to acknowledge the Public Science Project, of which Michelle is a co-founder. Based in the City University of New York, the Public Science Project conducts and supports participatory action research with a commitment to the significant knowledge people hold about their lives and experiences, and a belief that those most intimately impacted by research um, should take the lead in shaping research questions, framing interpretations, and designing meaningful products and actions. And finally, we want to acknowledge the official event sponsors, which include the Seventh Generation Fund for Indian Development, the Christensen Fund, the San Francisco Foundation, the Feldling Graduate University, the Bay Area Native Peoples Coalition for Grassroots Movements, the Joseph A. Myers Center for Research on Native American Issues, and Rachel Pfeiffer and Jill Nunakawa. So as you can see, we are a really diverse group of people, tribes, cultures, and institutions gathered here tonight. We have worked together, pulled resources to make this evening a reality. And I hope each and every one of you will congratulate yourself for taking part and know we are deeply grateful to you for your solidarity, your friendship, and your support. Because as you will hear tonight, that's what it takes to advance research justice in our communities. Okay, so we're all here in person tonight, but there is an online world out there. And this event uh, that we are trying to connect to and engage others in the conversation. So this event is being streamed live from the Data Center website. We encourage you to tweet with the hashtag researchjustice, all one word, no spaces, post on Facebook, among other social media tools. Following the event, there's going to be a special book signing. So books by the various speakers tonight are on sale in the lobby. And after the event is over, uh, the authors of these books, the speakers tonight, will be here to sign those books and to engage in more informal conversations um, after this event. So please stay and join us for that. Thank you. And now it's time for the blessing. And I'm very honored to introduce Anne-Marie Sayers and Ed Eddie Madrill. Anne-Marie Sayers is a Costanoan Olani local native and activist. She is a tribal per chairperson of Indian Canyon Nation and founder of Costanoan Indian Research. Her blessing will be followed by Eddie Madrill, who will share the hoop dance. Eddie is a member of the Pascua Yaqui tribe of Southern Arizona and Northern Sonora, Mexico. Please um, help me welcome Anne Marie Sayers and Eddie Madrill. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Ohlone Territory. We are still here. Ohlone Territory <clears throat> extends from San Francisco down to Big Sur, from the Pacific Ocean east to the Mont Diablo range. And there's quite a number of us here and 
many of us still live on the lands we have always been from. I happen to be from Indian Canyon. It's just south of Hollister. It's the only federally recognized Indian country for 350 miles along coastal California. We've opened up my great-grandfather's trust allotment to all indigenous people whom are in need of traditional lands for ceremony. The power of ceremony is unbelievably amazing. When you go, just go into the canyon, you can feel the ancestral spirits right there with you. And what it is you put out is what connects. So what I do, we have an imaginary burden basket that you put your imaginary burdens into before you enter the canyon. Because as you <clears throat> project negativity, the wind comes by and it goes further outside the canyon. NDD is a very legitimate mental disorder, and that's nature deficit disorder. Living in the city does deprive you of many things that are very natural. So when you do come to the canyon, it's just, you can connect, literally connect with all the life that surrounds you. We are so lucky to have so many amazingly intelligent students and interns that partake in many different projects, primarily environmental and particularly with San Francisco State University. Over the years, they have bought literally in excess of probably two to 3,000 students that are taking Native American classes. And it's so amazing how a decade will go by and there'll be students that will relate to their visit to the canyon. And it's that connection with what the natural elements that surround you when you go out. I would like very much if you would honor me in honoring the ancestral spirits on the land that we are on right now. Before I came in, I went outside and I offered tobacco and I asked the ancestral spirits on whose land we are on to guide me so that my words, my actions would honor them, the ancestors whose land I am on. And so I'm going to light some sage. And if we can put out in all four directions that what is shared here tonight does connect so that we can go forward in a good way. If we can stand and face east, I'd be most appreciative. Now, I know what direction east is in, even <laughs> inside, only because I had um, one of the professors uh, gave me a, what do you call those things? That, a compass. <laughs> if we can face east and let's let what is shared this evening connect so that we can take it out in a ripples effect that it does connect, that the diversity of Everyone, we are human. And those whom are absent of the sacred, share with them something so that they can see another lens. Pita Kanama, Sikampatian, Hetel Kanoso, Soto Kanoso, Noson. And now we can face south. Let's get the thoughts out there. Let them connect. Peter Kanama, Sikampatian, Hetel Kanoso, Soto Kanoso, Noson. West. Eddie, come up here with me, please.
Peter Kanama, Sikimpatian, Hetel Knoso, Soto Knoso, Knoso, and now North. Peter Kanama, Sikimpatian, Hetel Knoso, Soto Knoso. Ancestors, guide us so that our words and actions will be that which will honor you, the ancestors on whose land we are on. Allow the words that are being shared, the movement, the dance, to connect so that we can go, we can be free and become as one with all the life that surrounds us. No son. No son is in breath, so it is in spirit. You may sit down. I'm so happy you're here, Eddie. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. you. This man is one of the most amazing dancers in the world. He is so good. So good. As a matter of fact, July 13th, we're having our 17th Indian Canyon California Indian Storytelling event. Will you be free? Oh, for me, yes, I love it. Ken, did you hear that? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this is so great. Now, I really want to introduce an amazing, incredible individual who will introduce movement. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you for honoring the ancestors. Yes. I live to honor my ancestors. Now, an amazing, incredible man, Andrew. I know they already did an intro, but... Uh... I just want to say, first of all, thanks to all of you for being here. This is an amazing night, and I just wanted to say thank you to Anne Marie and Eddie uh, for being here. I've known both of them for many, many years, and Eddie for oh gosh, almost going on 20 years. Or I'll, I'll keep it, yeah, we'll keep it, we'll keep it low on the low end. But um, yeah, uh, we're in for a real treat, and I just want to thank him for being here, for blessing, for both of them, for blessing us with their their time. So, um, Eddie Madrill. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. I won't talk too long, and those of you who know me know that I can talk for a long time, so I'm going to really cut it short. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the hoop dance, the hoop dance is a storytelling dance that tells a story of creation, how all things were created. And when we learn through our sciences and Western ways, we understand that science tells us that everything starts from a single cell in mitosis and creates other things. And there's also the cycle of life, Krebs cycle, and all these other things. And as indigenous people from all around the world and every continent, we know that our stories, our dances, and our songs teach us our traditions and our histories and everything about geology, botany, so on and so forth. So. <laughs> this dance was given to me by different people, and I've understood it um, differently by different elders from different tribes, but it is a sacred dance to some people. It is a dance to heal people who are sick to some tribes. And it's also a dance that tells, uh, like I said, a creation story, how all things were created. And if you have that imagination as adults, which we used to have as children, but if you still have it today, then you'll see different things in the dance.
I hope you all enjoyed that. That's, uh, that's a beautiful gift. Good evening again, and thank you, Anne-Marie and Eddie, for blessing us with your words and your gifts from Creator. And thank you to all of tonight's co-sponsors, donors, and hosts. But most of all, thank you to all of you for coming out to tonight's event. My name is Andrew Jolivet. I'm of the Opelousa and Atakapaw people of Southwest Louisiana. I am an associate professor and the chair of the American Indian Studies Department at San Francisco State, uh, and also the vice chair of the Data Center Board. Um, uh, along with Margaret Ree, who's fabulous. I am the co-chair of the planning committee for this event, and I cannot tell you how excited I am about tonight's remarks and discussion between two incredible change agents who have dis demonstrated that research truly can change lives. This international conversation will explore important questions about the role of research justice in transforming society from the bottom up. Dr. Linda Smith and Dr. Michelle Fine, it is an honor to have you with us tonight. And on behalf of the entire program planning committee, together with the data center and our co-host, I thank you for creating a sacred space for our youth, for our most vulnerable, for our families. We thank you for bringing greater visibility and practice to the important work of research justice in achieving decolonization, not just in New Zealand and not just in the United States, but globally, right here in places like Oakland. So, so why are we doing this? Why are we all gathered here? What's this all about? Why the data center? Uh, why has this question come about? Why research justice? What does that mean anyway? For so many years, we're, we're celebrating two things that we said when we talked about this event. The 35th anniversary of the data center's work and its founding, the 15th anniversary of a seminal work like decolonizing methodologies, which asked a question, why is research a dirty word to indigenous people, to people of color, to people in urban communities? How do we change that relationship with research? How do we make it a relationship that a researcher, we're all researchers, our mothers, our aunties, our grandfathers, because research is about being a teacher. My students are my best teachers. And so tonight, this event is about a struggle for self-determination and human solidarity. But what does it really mean to seek solidarity in research with people who are different from us? It's not just to say we have something in common or that we're all human beings, it's to actually honor traditions, blood, sweat, history, the pain, to recognize that when we give of our spirit, right, that is returned to us and that that is a part of the process of moving forward. So we're asking tonight's speakers to really talk about, you know, what is happening right now at this political moment in our nation's history? Why is this such an important moment when so many people are thinking about, oh, you know, particularly with the, the election in the United States of Barack Obama, right? People think we're in this post-racial moment. We have this neoliberal agenda all across, not just in the United States, but globally, that we have reached some sort of progressive moment, some threshold. No, we haven't. We're actually regressing. I like to ask students, Brown versus Board of Education. That was a great choice, right? That was a great case. Was it? Do we want an integrated society that is just about reform? Or do we want to transform society? Do we want to revolutionize what it means to have access to a quality education? to not be afraid of being disappeared by INS, or to be incarcerated, right? Or to have your land polluted with toxic waste, right? To not be handed down more paternalism. And that's what I mean by neoliberalism. So tonight we are gonna engage in a conversation about research. And particularly I want you to think and hold this question. If we think about research as ceremony, 
What does that do to change the process? What does ceremony mean to all of you? Think back to your childhood, to your grandmother, to your grandfather, to your auntie, to your family, whoever was that caregiver for you. How did they involve you and make you feel that you had community? What are the senses, the smells, the sights that make you who you are? And so tonight, we're going to engage in this conversation to really say, how do we decolonize knowledge? This is the work and the mission of the data center to actualize the knowledge that we hold in our own communities and bring it to fruition, to reality, right? To work with people across differences so that they can make change possible, not to reform, to transform society. So research justice, I want us to all think about what does it mean to us? Why does it matter to all of us? How will it lead to ultimately to our liberation and self-determination? Because if other people are defining who we are, that's not self-determination, right? We have to define that. We have to reach for that human solidarity. So now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our speakers. And just to tell you a little bit about our format, each uh, Dr. Uh, Fine and, uh, and Dr. Tay Smith will each come up and give uh, brief remarks. And then we're going to sit down and have a moderated conversation, like you had at your kitchen table or out in the schoolyard. Right? Or like you have with your students if you're a teacher. Right? We're going to have a roundtable discussion. Yeah? And let me uh, start with Dr. Michelle Fine, who is a distinguished professor of social psychology, women's studies, urban education at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She has taught at CUNY since 1992 and is a founding, <coughs> excuse me, is a founding uh, member of the Public Science Project. It was through Dr. Rachel Pfeiffer Pfeffer, data, data Center's Research Justice Advisor, as well as a member of the event committee that introduced us to her, who in turn introduced us to Dr. Linda Smith. Michelle is relentless in her mentoring and guidance of research, research justice practitioners in training as well as in the field. And she is a key contributor to our research justice strategy development at the Data Center. So we thank you for your seeding of the very idea of this event, Dr. Fine. And we should note that this event is happening as the West Coast equivalent of the 15th anniversary celebration of Dr. Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies publication. Michelle hosted a colloquium which was powerful. We talked a bit about this at the reception beforehand at CUNY in New York with scholars from all over the world. Um, and um, that happened uh, just prior to Michelle flying out here to be with us. So I know that you've come a long way and so we really Thank you and honor you and uh, welcome you. Dr. Michelle Fine. Hello, everyone. This is an awesome space. I'm not used to speaking in churches much less churches that say freedom and equality and decolonizing knowledge and justice and truth. And I'm taken by not only the ancestors whom we've honored, but the, um, the struggles on whose shoulders we stand, the struggles that have probably been voiced in this very church. When I think of Oakland, I think of a community that has long been in struggle a community that has fought back with power, strength, and resilience. I know that young people last year fought against the um, closings of schools. Were some of you involved in that? Yeah? And I know that this has been a community where educators and activists and young people have been fighting against the school-to-prison pipeline. So I am, I am really honored to be standing on the grounds that you have all carved for us. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with the Data Center to celebrate your 35th anniversary. I feel like I have moved into a sauna with Linda to Huey Smith. Um, we spent three days on the East Coast and now we come to the West Coast. Um, and working with her, I have been uh, just graced to be thinking about intellectual, spiritual, political, and ethical questions of research justice. So thank you for inviting me, and thank you Rachel and Jill, and I'm gonna leave people out, and Andrew, and Miho, and all those people who wrote emails, thank you. <laughs> and now my time begins. 
To position myself, I am a, a faculty member at CUNY. I taught at University of Pennsylvania for a long time before that. I've been an activist for mm, a long time, decades and decades. Um, the Public Science Project, which is at CUNY, is a coalition of educators, youth, and activists. Students in and out of schools, prisoners in and formerly in prison. We work with lawyers, we work with public health officials, we work with policymakers, we work with organizers, and our task is to engage participatory work by communities with the recognition that people who have paid the highest price for injustice carry the most intimate knowledge about how to design research on that injustice. We stand to resist what I think of as the gated community of, res of policy researchers who are making decisions for young people, for educators, for homeless people, for incarcerated people, for immigrants, for working people. Our, our practice of research justice has a number of critical elements. One is that we believe expertise is widely distributed even if legitimacy is not. More particularly, we believe that people who know in their bellies the pain, the resilience, and the strength of what it takes to live in injustice deserve the right to shape the research questions about and for their communities. <laughs> Secondly, we are very interested in research that studies and exposes what we call circuits of dispossession and resistance. That is, when you are dispossessed from your high school because of a high stakes test, that has consequences not just for your education and your economic well-being, that has consequences for your housing, for your health, for your involvement in criminal justice, for the likelihood that you can stay in your home, that you will stay with your family. So we're interested in documenting these circuits across sectors. We're also interested in documenting the circuits that connect wealthy communities, bless you, to poor communities. That is, when wealthy communities get a better school, that money is coming out of those poor communities. And those com poor communities are not just watching their school close, but they are getting more cops. And so we are trying to understand the circuits that distribute opportunities, resources, but also solidarities, and I'll return to that. The third is that we're interested in research that speaks back to social movements. We're interested in research that changes theory, that changes policy, but much more profoundly, we are committed to research that feeds social movements. Largely, we've been working on educational justice and criminal justice, most recently on stop and frisk, that if you give me time, I will have time to talk about. I am most seriously concerned about the ways in which pseudoscience is used to deploy a systematic dispossession of young people from their schools, the most particular example being high stakes testing, which is not in places like New York, it's not only stratifying young people by race, ethnicity, class, and educational opportunity, but then it's evaluating their teachers and those same tests are being used to close their schools, a racial realignment of education like we haven't seen in many decades. So we are interested in occupying research. We are interested in research not only for its bloody exploitive history of what Thomas Teo would call epistemological violence, but we are interested in research in the way Ignacio Martín Barro, the El Salvadorian Jesuit priest who was killed in El Salvador, he saw research as a tool of liberation. He saw research as an opportunity to expose the collective lies that were being told about communities. We see research as an opportunity not just to expose the collective lie, but in the language of Maxine Green, to release the imagination because we must use research to go beyond critique and to imagine what could be. 
one of the saddest moments of this neoliberal moment is that people can't imagine what a good school looks like. They can't imagine what a safe community looks like. They can't imagine what a participatory governance would look like. And that too is our work. We are interested in research in the language of Arundhati Roy that tells a different story than the one we are being brainwashed to believe. And we are interested in research in the language of Gloria Anzaldúa that builds nos otras us, others, together. These are indeed treacherous times for the notion of the public. We are haunted by swelling inequality gaps. Former Secretary of Labor Rob, Robert Reich reminds us that the wealthiest 1% owns at least 25% of privately held wealth. And Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow, tells us that there are more black men in prison than were enslaved in 1850. And the Chronicle of Higher Ed continues to report that financial aid will not be available to poorer working class students, and maybe a small group of dreamers will be lucky. But we are not satisfied with talented 10th solutions, even as we celebrate minor victories. <laughs> British epidemiologists Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickus Pickett, tell us that these gaps, the, oh, that's really silly, halfway. Okay, these gaps between wealthy and poor, even more than how many people live in poverty, the gap between wealthy and poor is what predicts um, poor health, poor education, crime, lack of safety, lack of housing. So the equality gap, and when you stack up countries, you'll find the United States way at the top of equality gaps. I'm gonna skip, I'm not even gonna give time to the Koch brothers and the Broad Foundation and Walton and Gates. There was a whole paragraph about them, but we're not doing it. At the dawn of the 1900s, W.E.B. Du Bois published Crisis, a magazine committed to chronicling the ongoing exploitation of the African American community. He was a brilliant man. He understood that our country would not respond to what he called the ongoing moans of the darker race until there was a profit to be made. We are at that moment. If he and Naomi Klein, who wrote Disaster Capitalism, had a baby, it would be the neoliberal moment. When we find the perverse braiding of poor people's pain with corporate profit, which has become an American pastime, inscribed in federal, state, and local policy. I want to argue tonight that declarations of crisis have become an ideological foreplay to privatization, pitting us one against the others. In Detroit a few years ago, Shanandra Jones, a parent organizer, demanded at a public forum that educators should be sentenced to prison in the event that they do not increase students' test scores. I worry about this. I worry that, w that, that we have been led to believe that test scores tell us whether or not our schools are doing well, and I worry that we've been led to believe that prison is the only way to hold people accountable. And I worry that we are losing a sense of solidarity. I'm gonna give you one example of solidarity that I kind of love and then three projects and then that woman's gonna yell at me. So, um, Sylvia Kremer, she's an evolutionary biologist. She studies the social life of ants. And what she find, you know how ants make those amazing colonies? So what she finds is that you, if you inject one ant with smallpox, what do we do as humans when one person is ill or without housing or commits a crime? We banish them, we put them away, we send them far away. So when she injects um, one ant with smallpox, the entire colony licks that ant clean. And two things happen. One is that ant is better. And the second is that the collective immunity of the entire colony rises. That's research justice. So I'm going to give you three examples, really quick ones. So, 
So our, our, um, at the Public Science Project, we are really blessed to have amazing colleagues, activists, community organizers, progressive policymakers who turn to us and with us and say there's a policy coming up. We need to know how the people who are living in these conditions, how they think about stop and frisk, how they think about uh, policing with dignity, how they think about high stakes testing, how undocumented immigrant women um, contend with domestic violence. So I'm gonna give you three projects and then uh, we'll go through the details later. 1994, President Bill Clinton took Pell Grants out of prisons um, with the Violent Crime Act. Very, very quickly, a group of women that I was working with, including Kathy Boudin, Judy Clark, uh, Donna Hilton, etc., cetera, uh, Medalia Martinez, uh, decided the college had to come back to this prison. It was a maximum security prison for women. They mobilized the community to bring college back. They asked us to document the impact of college. We said we would do it if we could do a participatory research project. So we created a research camp for a year and trained a number of women in prison to collect data with us. So we were a research team of eight of us from inside prison, seven of us from outside prison, documenting the impact of college on the women, their children, their post-release outcomes, uh, and their activities, their contributions to society afterwards. We produced a report called Changing Minds that's available online at the Public Science Project, and it was a remarkable experience of working with a group of women inside prison who understood obviously a ton more than I did about prison, but also about the passion and possibilities of college in prison. And when we interviewed their children and said, what's it like to have a mother in college in prison? The kids would say, she is such a pain now, all she wants to talk about is homework. <laughs> or now I tell my friends, my mom's upstate, she's in college. And when we interviewed the correction officers, many of whom loved and many more of whom hated the program, they said, I don't, some of them said, I don't really like this program. Um, I can't afford college for myself and my kids, and yet, and yet they're getting it. Um, but I know that at night the women are reading and not fighting, and I know they're not coming back. And so with that knowledge, we then, two minutes, offered a, uh, a set of courses where the, the correction officers could also take classes. And at the end of that year, the women in prison who were researchers said, we've got to have a benefit for um, the children of women in prison, the children of murder victims, and the children of correction officers, because they understood that solidarity was at the core of this research project. Fast forward to the third research project. Most recently, we've been involved in the stop and frisk catastrophe in New York, in New York City. Uh, we've been doing a systematic study Right around, anybody know Yankee Stadium? Right around Yankee Stadium, one of the toughest police precincts in the city, toughest, that is, the most stop and frisk, the most physical handling, the most racial assaults on young people, the most arrests, and one of the most innocent arrests. 90% of stop and frisks are innocent arrests. We went up to the community. There was a huge outcry about stop and frisk. We went up to the community with lawyers, with colleagues. We put together a research group of six young people, two older women who are scared of the police but also scared of the young people, a bodega owner, a former correction officer. That's the research team. They collected the Marsh Justice Project, collected data from 3,000 people in the community about their interactions with the police. About four months ago, on a chilly fall night, maybe six months ago, we got the Illuminator, which is a, a van funded by Ben and Jerry's, in the middle of the Yankee Stadium community, projecting the data up on the side of an apartment building. And the youth researchers read the data. You can go online and watch the video. It was Dear NYPD like in that Robin and Batman kind of image. And there were like Dominican drummers before the community was um, sitting around us. 
We surveyed 1,250 people. We learned that last year you made 3,702 stops in our community. 90% of these were innocent. We learned that 42% of our young people were called racial names by you. Please don't do that. These are our babies. Please don't stop us when we're on the street. We live here. And we learned that you got eight guns for those 3,702 stops. And last week, our local church had a gun buyback. And in an hour, they got 85. It's been an amazing project. I have some leaflets because we've now compared stop and frisk in that district, 40, District 44, and in the East Village. Anybody know who lives in the East Village? <laughs> NYU students. All right, so there are many few stop and frisks in that community, but much more drugs found when they stop people, much more drunk behavior, many fewer innocent stops, much less frisking, much less um, throwing people on the ground, much less racial assault, much less young people. In the Bronx and throughout New York City, young people of color are growing up policed. So we are now bringing young people from the Bronx together with young people from Brooklyn, together with young people hopefully from Oakland, to build a kind of cross site solidarity, using research that documents both the circuits of dispossession, but also the powerful circuits of resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, I, just one quick uh, announcement. KPFA will be airing tonight's event uh, in June, so please uh, check it out and tune in. I was just told that information. Next, I'd like to introduce Linda Tewai Smith, uh, Professor of Education in Maori Development and Pro Vice Chancellor Maori at the University of Waikato. She has worked in the field of Maori education for many years as an educator and researcher and is well known for her work on Kuapa Maori research. Professor Smith has published widely in journals and books. Her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples, has been an international bestseller in the indigenous world and beyond since its publication in 1998. More recently, Professor Smith was joint director of Napa Ta Marataranga, New, New Zealand's Maori Center of Research Excellence, and Professor of Education at the University of Auckland. Professor Smith is from the Tuawai in New England, Nakte Awa, and I'm going to mispronounce, I apologize, uh, Nakte Paru. Um, uh, as Miho, our executive director, mentions in her welcome letter, Linda's book literally gave birth to the renewed vision for the new leadership at the data center some years ago and the spirit of what we call research justice. Dr. Linda Smith. Greetings in my own language. Let me acknowledge the elder who evoked at this event the ancestors who once walked this land and who had a relationship with this land and who are still in this land. Thank you also to the data centre and the funders of this event for inviting me here. I am also attending the American Education Research Association meeting, but tonight I'd much rather be here with you. <laughs> um, and thank you to all of those who have organised this event. Um, it's a great honour for me to share a platform with Michelle Fine. I first met her 15 years ago, invited her to New Zealand, and she's been such um, an inspiration to know that other people in the world think crazy things like I do um, has been really important. 
let me position myself as well. I'm from New Zealand, and that's connected to California through the Pacific Ocean. My ancestors traveled that ocean over hundreds of years and eventually settled in New Zealand. These ancestors who had navigation knowledge beyond what our colonizers told us, um, traveled the largest waterway in the world. It is our land as well as our waterway. And I acknowledge the Pacific Ocean here in this gathering as well. My work and what I write about has come out of my context, come out of New Zealand, come out of a story of my ancestors, Māori, my tribal traditions and my life. It comes out of a story of British imperialism, which also came out of European imperialism, which also came out of the Enlightenment. I studied the Enlightenment as a history student. I had to, because I wasn't taught my own history in the university. But I became very good on the Enlightenment story. <laughs> I came to understand that interesting marriage of power, economic wealth, spiritual and moral superiority, and the oppression of millions of peoples in my part of the world and in your part of the world. I don't want to pretend that I've written anything other than what I have written about my, my experience and the experience of my people. But I thank all of you who've seen in that story something that resonates with your stories and with what you are interested in. If you ask me what my research, current research project is, or what my research program is, I think I've come to the conclusion that I research, research. <laughs> now, I could not have told you that 15 years ago, but I think now I can tell you that I've really researched the institution that we know as research, the institution that we know as academic knowledge, the institution that we know as the nexus of knowledge, research, power. That is what I have thought about, not only over the last 15 years, but probably over the last 40 years as an educator as well. In the 1960s, I did actually attend secondary school in Illinois. And I was here in the US when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, like many of my indigenous um, brothers and sisters, I was profoundly influenced, firstly by the civil rights movement, and then by the American Indian movement, and then by the feminist movement, and then by the gay and liberation movement. And when I attended university in the early 1970s, all those movements were active um, on campus. And believe it or not, we did sit together, eat together, and plot together. But as an indigenous activist, we thought our story was somewhat special. We thought it was special because it was buried deep in our land. And that it was as much a part of who we were as a generation as it was about who our ancestors were and about who our land was. And we thought that that specialness in our radical politics gave us a different kind of voice, a powerful voice, a voice that had an alternative worldview and an alternative set of origin stories alternative gene genealogies, an alternative language for talking about that. And we thought that was this amazing resource. It made us proud. 
it made us feel that you could take away everything, but you couldn't take away us, that we were intricately embedded in our land, and that that was a powerful voice. So I guess one of the critical questions that we've been asked to address tonight is how do you use concepts of research justice to create change in our world, and particularly in the world of public policy? And when I first saw this question, I thought, I have no idea. <laughs> I've been trying to do that for the last 25 years, and I am constant, and I'm just befuddled. Um, we've tried, we've thought about it, uh, we've put up great research, you might have all the evidence you like, but in the powerful world of public policy, you're also impacted by politics, by power, and by the common sense of society. So when I unpack that question a bit more, I think much of what we do in research and the kinds of research that I do has to be more than just documenting the truth or our story mm. or our truth. That's one part of it. Part of it is about mobilising others who believe that truth to be truthful. It is about mobilising knowledge resources. It's about mobilising opinion and experience and leadership in the community. It's about mobilising language and discourse. It's about having community leaders, doesn't matter whether they've read the research or not, having them stand up and support the researchers having them stand up and support the activists. It's about coming together despite huge differences in our community, about knowing tactically when to sing like a wonderful choir, multiple voices but in harmony, even though afterwards we might go out of the room and our disharmony might come through. So bridging the gap between research justice and public policy, I think, is a constant struggle. And it is something that researchers on our own cannot do. That researchers are one part. And in fact, researchers can be very inadequate in the communication of their research. I mean, Michelle is... Uh, probably an example of someone who can communicate in a powerful way the power of research. But so many good researchers are not the best communicators. Um, <laughs> with great yeah. respect to those of you here in the room. Everybody's like falling asleep. <laughs> we think writing in our academic journals is communication <laughs> enough. <laughs> Or we think having our students write it for us is even better. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak up to the power of public policy takes a number of beyond research strategies. It is not enough to have the evidence when those in power select which evidence matters. You can have 10 truths, but if those in power understand only one truth, then even if you are into numbers, which I'm not, 10 seems quite big, but if you're up against a group who only see one truth and one version of that truth, then 10 is insufficient. And that sort of un inequality in power relations or relations of power is, I think, an ongoing challenge. I think in my um, context, 
I mean, someone has asked, well, how do you decolonize knowledge? Like, what do you do? <laughs> I always find that a difficult question. And it's like, right, well, okay, firstly, um, <laughs> in order to decolonize knowledge, one has to have some understandings of knowledge, what it means to know, what it means to be known, what it means to come to know, what it means to understand what is known. How do those things, how do those ideas um, relate then to what does it mean to know and what does it mean to be? Mm. How is what we are, who we are, defined by what we know? And who tells us that? So for me growing up as an indigenous person, what we were told is we didn't count. We didn't matter. We had no knowledge. Our ancestors were dumb. They sailed across the Pacific by accident. <laughs> That's what we were told. It's really hard to get to New Zealand by accident. <laughs> Especially a group of men and women sailing by accident. Because if you know the Pacific, you don't go out fishing as men and women together on a canoe. One gender does that job. So to wash up by accident uh, in New Zealand without an appreciation of how to cross the Pacific, uh, it was one of those kind of moments when you think, well, that just cannot possibly be true. And I think sometimes those insights tell you then that the knowledge that is in the common sense of the world, the knowledge that is in textbooks, the knowledge that is passed down in classrooms does a number of things. It tells particular versions of what particular groups of people want to tell. It invisibilizes other stories. It turns some people into heroes and heroines and discoverers who weren't actually any of those things. It tells downright lies. It reshapes versions of stories. It obliterates peoples. It takes away from other people's version of what might have happened. When you begin to understand that and you start to read and you start to examine the curriculum in particular, then you're in the process of decolonizing knowledge. But it doesn't just stop with the official curriculum. Uh, it's very much about what is out in society, the myths about Native Americans, the myths about Pacific peoples, the myths about indigenous peoples worldwide. And the powerful use of discourse, the use of words like savage and barbaric and illiterate, and the connection of those words to a particular sets of behavior, and therefore, the fact that they need to be colonized, they need to be tamed, they need to be civilized, and they need to be Christianized. So just in summary, um, or before we move on to the next part of this talk, um, one of the questions was how do we use research to transform? How do we use indigenous community knowledge? And I really start from a simple base. Every one of you has knowledge. Every member of a community knows something special. Every indigenous person has knowledge. That knowledge is important. It is important to believe you have knowledge. 
it is important to believe that your knowledge is important and unique. It is important to value that you know, to understand what it means to know something. And then it is important to share what you know. Sometimes we tend to think what we know is so special that it's sacred. Perhaps it is. But sometimes its sacredness comes from putting the pieces of knowledge together collectively. That that's what makes knowledge sacred, is not that a few people know it, but that it is known by many. That's where I would start, for a community to believe that what it knows about itself is unique and is a story that needs to be told, but it is a story that actually only they can tell. I think if a community believes that, then the next step, the next steps in terms of documenting or the power of community knowledge, the power of indigenous knowledge, it actually becomes a really exciting project. And I've seen lots of examples where people go, I know something, I know something. You know, get out of the way. Let me tell my story. <laughs> it becomes its own momentum. But it is so important to believe that you know. That's the first thing in many of the communities that I've worked with. You know something, value it believe that you know it. Think about, you know, go home one night and go, wow, I know something really special. That's fantastic. Let's have a glass of wine over it. <laughs> I'm going to tell my grandchildren. I know, I am a knowing person. I know something about my experience, my world and no one else knows that. So that, to me, is the basis of building a picture of Indigenous community knowledge. How does that become data, or data, as you say? I think that's the easy bit. The easy bit is how you datify it. <laughs> you know, and often that's the bit that's most alien and strange to people. They want to tell their stories, and actually that process of storytelling is very, it's worth spending time on. It's worth celebrating. It's worth a public, um, well, you used the word ceremony, Andrew, but having those stories told publicly. It's worth an audience, because that's the other thing with telling a story and believe in you know something. It's to have others value your story. It's to have an audience for that story. And a community audience is the best accountability you can have, all right? Because my communities, boy, do they know bullshit when they hear it. <laughs> boy, do they know when genealogies don't connect. Do they know when family histories have got some significant gaps in them? All right, so communities are also the best accountability that keeps the knowledge uh, robust and rigorous. All right, keeps it coherent, keeps it connected. So it's not a fanciful story. It's a layered story of shared knowledge. I think the other thing when thinking about how you tell that story to those in power is remember that they do have two ears each, but there's no guarantee that those ears listen. And the strategy is how do you ensure that they listen through their eyes their ears, their stomach, their nostrils, and their skin. 
And I've seen so many examples where the use of ceremony or the use of the sacred or the use of spirituality or the use of performance or the use of poetry or the use of other forms of communication somehow get through the fact that the two ears don't know how to listen. So that the way we convey our messages, the way we speak our data is as important as generating it. And I'll finish there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and next I'd like to introduce uh, Sally Loa, uh, who is a Tongan Pacific Islander poet and community organizer. As a Pacific Islander mental health advocate, she focuses on reclaiming visibility and respect for queer Pacific Islanders and building healing practices together with Pacific Islander prisoners. As an artist, scholar, and community organizer, Fifi Lupe hosts KPFA's new radio program titled Healing Pathways. She's also national chair of the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Civil Rights Commission and active with several Pacific Islander social justice organizations, including OCNC, Oceana Coalition of Northern California. And now I'd like to introduce Fifi, uh, who will uh, give us a blessing. Thank you.
Fui and I would like to end with um, um, sharing a chant. It's a Hawaiian chant. Um, you know, when we came uh, through the Mormon church to Provo, Utah, um, my, our parents um, wanted to, us to have an American accent. So they stopped speaking English at home. And so we, we forgot a, our, our language and the chants and the songs. So it, we are very proud to, to be here and to um, say this chant that we learned from the Pacific Islander men in Solano prison. Um, they taught us this chant and um, the deepest great um, gratitude we have for them for this opportunity we have to speak it. The chant is, uh, it's when you gather the koa tree as a community from the highlands in Hawaii and you bring them down to the lower land so you could build that canoe to make that new voyage. And the voyage is of course always difficult, so you have to do it together. And so we, we, we say, eku mau mau. We stand up, stand up at intervals and we pull, we pull all with all our might, the branches and all. And we pull and that's, you'll hear this, um, the chant repeat itself. And then in the end, in the end we say the koa trees, they are gods, we see them run. And I also want to invite my students who are in here, um, our students from the Pacific Islanders in the United States class at UC Berkeley, they're here, and they know this chant. So I want to invite them also to participate with us. Wow, that was beautiful. This is such a beautiful night, and um, thank you all for being a part of it. So we're here at the kitchen table now, and I really um, enjoyed both of your remarks. And one of the things that struck me as I heard you both talking, and you talked a little bit about your projects, your personal stories a bit, and you have there's so many people here who came and wanted to hear your work because they've been inspired by it, they've read your work, or um, it's inspired them to get involved in their communities. And it it reminds me of this question, our former dean at San Francisco State, who's um, uh, Apache, uh, he, you know, he asked, we had a meeting recently to talk about how do we connect with our students. And he asked that this question, a very basic one, he said is that, who am I? When students come to a college campus, that's that very fundamental question they ask is, and Linda, you were kind of saying that toward the end of your remarks too, of where that sort of 
inspiration or how we find out who we are because I always tell this too to graduate students. You find that you study who you are sometimes, especially in indigenous communities and in people of color communities or poor communities or any marginalized population. I think we study who we are. And for me, when I was growing up, I remember I tell my students this when I go, you know, either speaking in classes or at different talks around the country about um, this story. When I was um, in the first grade, I was in tracked classrooms. This was in the um, very early 1980s, and I flunked the first grade. And I asked people, I said, how do you, you're six years old, how do you fail the first grade? What are you doing in first grade that you can fail, <laughs> right, that you can flunk? And I make a joke of it, you know, I tell them, I say, how do you fail, right? Isn't it the teacher or the school or the institution that fails? And I still remember to this day that it was my mother, there was a, you know, in our little tiny bathroom in the house, she took me, she said, come in here because I was all crying and scared to tell my dad. I thought he was going to, you know, be really upset. And they weren't. They were actually, you know, really disappointed with the school. And she took me to a mirror and she said, look in the mirror and I want you to say, I am somebody. Mm. And my mother passed away seven months ago uh, in September. And I still carry that. I think about that so much every day that she made me repeat that three times. I am somebody. And I, and I share that to say that a lot of our young people don't have somebody. I feel so fortunate that somebody told me that, that I matter. I talk about this concept in my own work of radical love and what that really means to say that we have radical love. Does it mean that we just act with good intentions and that's okay? Missionaries, Cook, right? Columbus, they act, acted, right, with these sort of good intentions. Um, but what's the actual impact? And so I think it's important that we think about who makes us who we are. And so I wanted to share that and then also just, just for some context setting. And then this other thing that my father used to tell me, he would say we're from southwest Louisiana, as I mentioned, the Opelousa and Attack of Ball, but French Creole. And uh, there's this expression, faire quoi tu vas faire, Tibourg. It means do what you must do. Do what you have to do, young man, so you can do what you must. And so what he told me, like a college counselor that I had, he said, you know, Get your education first, because once you have your education, no one can take that from you. And I think that research has the same power to do that. And so what I wanted to ask you both to maybe just to open with to start is what inspires you? What, which, who, who told you that I am somebody or that got you to do the kind of work that you're doing? What inspires you to mm -hmm. do the work that you're doing? Um, would either of you like to start? I just think it's what I'm born to do. Um, well, the one thing I, I know for certain from the very beginning of my existence is I am loved. But I also learned at an early age that others are not loved and that it is important, therefore, to find ways to love everyone, find ways to love each other, find ways to extend that love through everything that we do. I never started out, I never, actually, when I was at university, I had no idea what I would do afterwards. I had no aspirations to be an educator. I didn't know what the word researcher meant. I thought that when I finished my degree, somehow I would just magically get a job, someone would absolutely want to employ me, and after that, everything would be just fantastic. And of course, you know, life didn't work like that. Um, I, I ended up being a teacher that was the last thing I wanted to do. <laughs> but, you know, I was young. Um, I was chasing someone who also wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> uh, I ran out of money, so I needed a job to go teaching. And somehow I fell into it. But the research thing, when I studied research and I started to read methods books, it clicked in that there was something off about what I was reading.
couldn't put my finger on it. I, I didn't know what was unsettling me. Um, all I knew was the more I read, the more it didn't make sense. And of course, I was arrogant enough to think that I wasn't the problem, mm. that it wasn't that I couldn't read, mm. but that it was something in my reading. And so it really, it's like, you know, undoing a, a ball of wool. You find the thread and you just start to pull it and see what happens. And then you think, oh, if I yank it, you know, a bit more comes out. Mm. Um, and just really following that model of trying to undo it, trying to understand it. And, you know, now you can talk about decolonizing methods. People talk about it, but actually... 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, uh, that was not two words you could put together. You mm. could not put those two words together. Mm -hmm. Nor could you put indigenous research, mm. nor could you put indigenous methodologies together. So I thought I was a little bit odd <laughs> uh, when I started. Mm. I thought at first my ideas were I knew they were different. They were different from everyone else I'd ever read. But I also knew because I was traveling around the world, um, listening to indigenous communities and speaking with them, <coughs> I knew in those communities the message um, about research was not unusual. Every community I went to, if there was, if conversation was moved to research, and I hear it even to this day, someone will stand up and say, I'm from such and such a people and we are the most researched people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard that from Sami land and the Arctic Circle to Australia, <laughs> North America, wherever I've been. <laughs> and that perception of being researched, the most researched, to, to make that kind of statement. It's, it's actually an interesting statement to make because it seemed to me what it conveyed is the sense of someone coming and doing something and doing it more to us than they could possibly do to anyone else. And then to be left with just that statement. That that's the only statement you could make not a statement which says, and it transformed our lives, <laughs> and it improved our circumstances, and it restored our treaty rights. No, <laughs> it's just a, sa a statement which said, we are the most researched peoples of the world. That's it. So to me, it's been a journey. Um, you know, the inspiration is actually when I see our communities and when I see our young people being proud of who they are and when I hear them speaking our language, mm. uh, when I see them aspire to be astronauts and an Indigenous person at the same time, when I see them practising their indigeneity across the world, that's what inspires me. Mm. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Michelle? <laughs> well, you inspired me to tell a mama story. What was your mom's name? Annetta. Annetta? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, so, um, hmm. So I think I've always been like looking for silenced voices. Um, m my mother was Rose, was the youngest of 18 and um, all four foot eight of her. Hmm. And I lost her a, a little over a year ago. And um, so I was her youngest and my parents were Jewish immigrants from Poland who came here when they were kids. And, um, and I was youngest by a lot. So we grew up in suburban New Jersey. I grew up in suburban New Jersey in a highly assimilating Jewish family. We had like Christmas trees. Anybody Jewish with a Christmas tree? <laughs> Not an unusual combo, right? Um, 
And uh, my father was like straight out of, you know, I, we used to have this thought that like, there was a group of capitalists at Ellis Island who like when my dad was seven, they said, let's make that one successful, right? So <laughs> my dad sold plumbing supplies, but you know, he did all right for a kid from Poland. And um, so, so every morning he would leave the house with my brother and sister and I would be home with my mom and my mom was very depressed and lay in bed as, as was true for a whole generation of women, particularly I think a slice of white women locked in the suburbs who mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thought they might have had, right, and didn't have the whatever. It's a longer analysis, I won't do it. Anyway, so she had migraines, and so I was the little chubby girl watching TV with a bowl of frosted flakes, it, like, like down there, and her bedroom was over there, and, and like my brother Richard and my sister Sherry and my dad would like go to America every morning out the front door. And my mom would lay in bed. And, um, and she was also adorable and funny and, and ridiculous and hysterical. And anyway. Um, and I'm, I'm really still very close to her. She's not here now. But, and um, so I think that when I wrote Framing Dropouts, a book some of you um, might know, I, I think like I've always been looking for, can we legitimate the wisdom that my mom had yes. in that bed yes. as my dad went out to the world? And he was a good guy too, but uh, you know, nobody knew he was legitimate. And, and nobody actually really knew, like I knew. Mm. And, and then when she, when she was dying, sorry if this is too long, but oh, please. Annette, Annette? Annetta. Annetta inspired me. So when my mom was dying, um, I actually got like a month just to hang out with her in mm. um, one of those places. And she was pretty healthy. So she wasn't in pain. And so we would like lay in bed. And then I mentioned earlier my friend Kathy Boudin. And um, when Kathy was in prison, her mom was good friends with Tilly Olson. And Tilly Olson had written a book of letters from mothers to daughters. And Tilly Olson gave Kathy's mother the book and then Kathy's mother gave it to Kathy. And then when Kathy was in prison and her mother was dying, she would read her from the book on the phone. Got it? So then Kathy gave me this book. So I was sitting in my mom's room reading to her, I think it was a piece from Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and I think it was Zora Neale Hurston who said, as my mom lay dying, she couldn't speak, but her eyes were wide. Mm -hmm. And as I looked at her, I realized her eyes were saying, you tell my story. Mm -hmm. And I read that to my mom and she said, I have so much to say. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me, to, you know, I'm like taking notes and writing articles and, and really just smelling and loving, touching her, I have to say. And, um, and she said, it's written on my heart, you say it. And I feel like that's what I do. Like I find dropouts who are brilliant and then I go to prison and I'm so honored to learn from, like, like, that's not work, that's not, maybe it's inspiration, but I actually think like the people who clean this place know a lot about us that we don't know about them. And um, so that's the work. And then I can stretch that up to social movements and activism and, but it's Rosie in her, you know, whatever. Um, before she died, obviously, we went bra shopping. This is a really good story. And um, <laughs> she was 4'8", but all breast. Uh, anybody have a mother or grandmother like? And she was like 93, and the women said, your mother's bras are disgusting. So we went to a bra store, and you ever go to a bra store? It's ridiculous, like the first third, I'm done, halfway point. The first third of the stores are like breasts that are ready, or they, I don't know, they're already, the bras are already, anyway, so we had to go to the back where they did. And so 
uh, it's a long story, but at the very end, we finally get a bra. She said she was a 34B. She was like a triple G. And, <laughs> and at the very end, we turn to the woman and say, how much does this cost? This is a woman who had arrived from some other country five minutes ago, and she said, oh, $60. And my mother said, I'm 92 years old. Can I rent this? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm done. I won't answer the next question. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Thank you for sharing your mom, Rosie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to remember that story. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to combine a couple questions here. Um, what I heard, especially in your story just now and, and in, in your comments as well, Linda, is this whole notion or idea of voice, how we inspire voice and bring voice um, uh, in communities where there's so much invisibility. I mean, in, in, in some of the work, that's what I see as well um, in Native communities, particularly for people who experience multiple forms of marginalization. Maybe they're queer or mixed race or they're incarcerated, um, poor. Um, how do we work to, you know, think about what are the, what are the most powerful ways um, that we can decolonize knowledge. We talked a lot about that, and that's a big word, right? We say decolonize knowledge. When we unpack that, when we think about these communities, indigenous people or people of color, urban, working class communities, how do we do that work of transformation? What does it look like? And how has your work tried to bridge that gap between research as a dirty word um, for those communities? How does it try to seek solidarity uh, with communities who are facing these multiple forms? I think it's been important uh, in my work that the communities see research as something that they can do themselves. That it is not um, the exclusive preserve of people who are academics, and who work in the academy. That research is something that everyone can do. It's re research is something our ancestors did. And we have traditions of knowledge. If you just simply think of research as creating knowledge, then we are all creators of knowledge. And the first creation of knowledge um, is what we generate the understandings we generate about ourselves, our experience, and our world. And, you know, to me that's, that's the starting place, is to, for our communities to believe that we can do research. So I never think of decolonizing methodologies as being an anti-research book. Mm -hmm. To me, mm -hmm. it's very much about thinking about research in different ways, coming to understand other possibilities for research, opening up new methodologies that discover new kinds of knowing, um, producing new kinds of researchers, researchers who work well in our communities. Um, you know, we can use the word community in a very loose way, but in my world, you can't just pop up in a community and go, I'm a researcher. <laughs> Hi. You know, that, that's just, that's not Let the ceremony in. to yes. go through um, when you are entering. Let as me help a you, right? Yeah. <laughs> there are protocols, um, there's, you know, just the whole ethics of being a researcher, the profession of being a researcher, understanding community dynamics, uh, understanding that communities aren't perfect and that not everyone in the community is nice or needs you to save them. Mm -hmm. You know, that our communities are complex, dynamic, absolutely full of rich personalities, <laughs> if I put it like that, um, but able to produce knowledge and insights about what's going on in that community. And I'm talking about it's a, you know, you can talk about a youth community or, you know, maybe a geographic community or a p particular interest group community. So it does have different permutations. Uh, but 
to me, you know, academic research, the particular kinds of scientific research are so distant from what people can do. And often it overwhelms everyone. So, you know, I know we often have um, hearings or tribunals mm -hmm. and the experts are mm -hmm. called in to give expert evidence which is based on expert research. And it's as if the people cannot give their own expert evidence. They're just called, you know, oral stories. They're allowed to tell their stories but the expert evidence is provided by experts who have degree qualifications, mm -hmm. who have experience, who have a discipline. And in our context, we've had to try and train the experts <laughs> and the non-experts mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of our community ones who aren't seen as experts so that everyone can really disrupt that um, positioning of mm -hmm. knowledge as being the preserve of the few mm -hmm. and this kind of sense of authoritative knowledge comes from only one source and that communities cannot be authoritative because of course they didn't write it down mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that that's the main criteria used and if then they wrote it down it's seen as well they're biased mm -hmm. yeah yeah. So you have to go and get somebody else to write it down. And of course, and they're not biased. And then it counts. <laughs> but they're totally ignorant of what the story is. Yeah. So there, there are these um, structures around research. And it's the way it kind of, that's why I describe it as an institution. It has values, it has rules and regulations. It has systems that continue to privilege a particular approach to research. And I think my whole career has been about trying to insist that our communities can speak for themselves, mm -hmm. that they have expert knowledge, mm -hmm. um, not just of the distant past of ancestors, but expert knowledge of now, mm -hmm. expert knowledge of their experience. But more than that, they have aspirations and visions about the future. So they can not only describe what's gone wrong, but they have solutions for how to make things right. And that's often what's missing. Uh, you know, when we're talking about public policy, it's once again, only experts can design the solutions. Mm -hmm. And of course the solutions never work mm -hmm. um, because experts don't understand the wonderful communities that we have. You can design a perfect solution in an office in Washington, D.C., or in Wellington, mm. and it is a totally imperfect solution when it arrives at community Oakland. Exactly. Mm. That, yeah. that transfer from mm -hmm. design to reality is a complex kind of process, but it requires community knowledge to make things work. So to me, the, the knowledge part is not just about describing experience. It's knowing solutions, knowing what will work. It's that creative component of how do you, how do you move to the next level? So you're not just critiquing, you're not just telling your story, you're not just feeling good about identity, mm -hmm. but you're able to put all those things together in a way which says, and tomorrow's gonna look like this, and next week we're going to be doing this, and next month we have all these things planned. Mm -hmm. And no. Mm. Thank you. It reminds me just uh, some of the things you were saying too earlier that it reminds me of this great quote. I was, I've done some work with the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of mm -hmm. Washington, and there's this great quote we don't need more Indian experts, we need more expert Indians. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really. Yeah. Yeah. solidifies yeah. what it is that you're saying, Linda, and also speaks to what you were saying when you were talking about your mom and all those young mm -hmm. people and um, young women and incarcerated youth mm -hmm. that you've worked with and, and folks of color, that we also need to change in the same way that we've changed how we talk about research, what, that, what counts as research and methodologies, but also what's an expert, right? 
who is a legitimate expert, I think is a really important question. And the other thing that I wanted to um, add as you address that question that Linda was bringing up is the ethics question, the protocols. Because I talk about it a lot in like research methods in American Indian studies and a lot of tribes like the Navajo, they have their own institutional review board at that mm -hmm. tribe. Mm -hmm. You have to get permission before you can mm -hmm. go there to do those things. How do we actualize that in community groups in you know, groups that are working with incarcerated folks in you know, nonprofit organizations, do, sh do they need, should we have protocols in place before someone comes in and does research? How do we do that at the ground level too, not just at the sort of academic institution? Because in all honesty, IRB, Institutional Review Boards, is to protect the institution, not mm -hmm. to protect the participants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you could comment a little bit as you um, sort of address this sort of question about how we really do this work of transforming knowledge and bridge that link between research is a dirty word, but also does that help when we add the question of ethics and protocols in place does, and who's an expert? Because your work speaks so beautifully to, you know, showing who the true experts actually are. Um, I think that that would be great if you could speak a little bit to mm. that as well. Thank you. That's about 11 questions. I know, I'm sorry, I do um, that a lot. <laughs> so, so we're really, there on all of the projects that we're involved in, we have these research camps where we bring together all the people who are doing research with their various forms of expertise, whether it's experience or law school or et cetera. Um, and we kind of deconstruct in, in the way that Linda was describing. We have, particularly with young people, we have them draw what's a researcher look like, and it's always a short white guy with glasses and a lab coat. And, and so we put that up on the wall, and then we have them take pictures of themselves and identify what kind of expertise they bring. And, and actually, we have to do a pretty deliberate analysis of the things that you might feel shame about is actually the knowledge that we need to reframe the research. So we'll have young people you know, read articles that have been written on teen pregnancy. We'll have young mothers read that. And then they get a sense of, oh my God, that's how they talk about us. Um, and then it's an invitation to rewrite the literature, to rewrite, and then they bring in spoken word or hip hop, which is another literature that speaks to experience. So we have lots of kinds of expertise in the room. On Saturdays at the Graduate Center, um, we often have what Brett Stout calls stats for the people. So we're teaching young people and community members how to deconstruct uh, large big data that's being used against us. So they do secondary analyses of NYPD databases. And these are kids who are like failing math, but they are really good at cross tabs when they're thinking about like stop and frisk. Mm. And they've got a million opinions, as, as some of you know, because you've been in the work with us, about I can't believe you asked about race. You should have asked about skin color. Or I can't believe you asked about sexuality. You should have asked about gender nonconforming. Like, you know, <laughs> so they become very smart about how they would be researchers. Um, and then, I, I'm just trying to give examples that reveal how we queer the question of expertise from the front. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a project now, a participatory project with formerly incarcerated college students. And the project is simply called The Gifts They Bring. Right? The gifts formerly incarcerated college students bring to the university that universities don't know are gifts because they don't allow them. When you frame it as gifts, rather than stigma, rather than, oh my God, are you gonna assault somebody? But what knowledge do you bring about institutions, about remorse, about responsibility, about being a role model, about giving back, about racism, about mass incarceration? What are those knowledges? The whole, the whole tenor of how we create a research team shifts. Um, we also do a lot with performance and embodied methodologies, Maddie Fox, who's uh, one of the uh, researchers at the Public Science Project, she comes out of a family that does um, theater of the oppressed. And so we'll get a quantitative um, finding or a story, and then we'll have young people act it out or tell us where in their body that piece of data lives. For instance, we ran a, an analysis of, you know, if your mom didn't graduate from high school, 
What are your outcomes compared to if your mom did graduate from high school? And we all know that having a mother who's been deprived of a high school diploma has consequences for young people. Well, these young researchers were actually doing the analysis and we could just feel in the room this was not an empowering analysis. And so Maddie did like a quick, where is this in your body? Do a human sculpture, what's up with this? And of course, all of their moms had not graduated from high school. And so these kind of easy, predictive analyses were entirely undermining. So they decided to do a side project on the power of their mothers, right? And how they kind of mediated being deprived of a high school diploma and what they did for their kids to buffer the negative impact. So it's, it's not a, a, a one-shot moment. Um, on ethics, I think for us, the biggest ethical question, there are now community boards, et cetera, and um, we've complicated the question of ethics. I think this question of epistemological violence is huge. Mm. The extent to which our research paints communities in disparaging and degrading ways. And so for us, the big ethical question is, what are the questions, what's the evidence, who owns the data, what do we say out loud, and what other kinds of analyses can be told that don't locate the source of the problem with the very group that um, pays the highest price for injustice. We have a conflation in social science that we look at the we look at the outcome of injustice as though it is the cause of injustice. Martin Luther King gave a talk in 1968 at the APA and he said, Negroes need social science, but white people really need social science to understand how their souls are poisoned by racism because they confuse the outcome of oppression with the cause of oppression. They think the problem is the Negro himself. Mm -hmm. so, Th that's a big ethical question that IRBs do not care about, right? But it yeah. seems to me that's a piece of work that we need to be taking on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll come to that. And do you mind if I ask them something first, or you want me to ask this now? You want me to ask this now? I'm all, should I take moderator license? Um, can you comment on the significance or importance that you see of having an independent movement-based research justice institution like the data center? Mm. Mm. Well, I was on the website for the data center and I got more excited as I started to read what the data center does. I think it, it fills a powerful gap or, you know, it fills this huge gap uh, in where communities are and the role that research can play in terms of, uh, in terms of attaining or struggling for social justice. I can see, you know, I have a number of uh, parallel examples in New Zealand where we have community-based research organisations. So I'll just spell out some of the reasons why I think the work of the data centre is important. Most research really is captured by institutions, large ones. Large ones that are driven by other motivators beyond what communities might be trying to achieve and beyond um, social justice. If I put it simply, institutions don't really care. Individuals in those institutions might care a great deal, but the institutions themselves struggle um, to care. And so the data centre fills this intermediary role between what communities are doing, what's required, and what other you know, institutional researchers are doing. It also fills a brokering role in terms of how can, do you mobilise other researchers who can come in and help a particular project. I think it fills an immediacy role. Um, you know, often our communities need, they need information like now. 
They don't have time for a longitudinal study <laughs> to find out, <laughs> you know, over a 20-year period why something isn't working now. So they need a kind of centre that can mobilise and generate um, rapid research, if I put it like that. There's a sense of immediacy about what the needs are. I think they also need the combination of research and communication or what's called transfer or translation. So research into policy, research into action, research into um, resources or resource development. And certainly, you know, speaking for myself in an institution, we're terrible at doing those next steps. You know, research, we're tired, the project's finished, we fall over because we're, we're at it. Um, but we don't really have the expertise to do the next piece, which is the translation piece, uh, making it powerful, making it work. So I think the role of an intermediary group like the data centre, which is close to the community, which clusters in parallel with the community, not with the institutions, is absolutely important. I really want to congratulate the data centre on 35 years of doing that, uh, because that has to be rare, mm. and I really do. Um, I just think it's fantastic, and I hope another 35 years mm. of work mm. is ahead of you. Um, do you want to add anything, or can I ask you all a closing, like, little wrap-up thing? Can no. I just do a little quickie, or they're not going to be yes, for my flight home or something? No, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so when I met Miho, um, I thought, oh, separated at birth. How great, right? <laughs> the, the data center is do, has been doing this work for 35 years, and th there are three or four things that I just love that you all do that uh, that I haven't really seen done well elsewhere. One is that you take up social justice policy issues and tell a very different story than the dominant story being told, whether it's about juvenile justice or domestic workers or public transit. The second is that you lift up from community concerns a set of issues that should be policy issues that aren't, right? Um, a third is that you document um, oppression and possibility. One of the things that I think happens a lot with progressive research is we confuse evidence of damage mm. as evidence of oppression, and the only way to say that things have been unjust is to say people are broken, and that you seem to refuse to do that. Mm. That you document all the ways in which people are strong, resilient, and fighting back despite the injustices that that they endure, and that you have some kick-ass ways of disseminating mm. research, right? That you've got some visuals and some graphics and some online stuff, and because you're so deeply embedded with community and organizing, that it's, it's a kind of seamless project, so that you've you figured out how research is just another tool in the struggle for social justice. It's not the answer, it's not the only tool, you're, you're not uh, you don't presume injustice is a cognitive problem. I work with people who think injustice, like if only people knew those folks didn't like to be treated unfairly, right? So we'll give this some data and explain that they don't like to be treated unfairly. Like you get it, it's not a cognitive problem, but it's one more tool with outrage, with politics, with organizing, with mobilization, there's research for justice. So thank you so much for the amazing work you do. I think they want me to stop, so you don't, do you want me to stop? <laughs> Can I ask? Okay, thank you. Just making sure they're not gonna yell at me. Um, no, we, as you all know, we got a little bit of a late start, so I think we're just trying to uh, not keep you longer than we s said the event would last. But as we sort of come, because we have a few, few more things that we wanna do, and they are you know, really important things, but as we sort of wrap up, this has been a really important conversation, and I just want to add, too, as, as someone that's been, you know, a fan of the data center for a long time and have joined the board just in the past year, I would just add, too, that it is about 
I mean, sometimes we use the word love really loosely. Mm-hmm. But, you know, listening to what you both said, too, it's just such a reminder that all of the staff, the people who work so hard to make this event happen, that go out into the community, that it really is ultimately, research justice is about love, right? Not surrendering to all the hate that exists in the world. And your work, both of you, speaks to that notion of love, right? That love is a radical act. And so I'm wondering what words of um, advice might you have for people here who are seeking to engage in the work of research justice as an act of love that, like love, it can be painful, it can be hard, it can be difficult, it can be challenging. And why do we continue to do it? How do we do it beyond just resisting or being resilient or surviving? How do we take it to another level when we think about research as justice and as an act of radical love? So parting words of wisdom, I guess. Mm. <laughs> I think the, I guess what everyone hopes is that just injustice goes away. You know, that the work we do actually makes a difference and that a, a greater and more just community and society uh, replaces what we might have now. So that work towards transformation is really work in progress. I think one of the difficult things is not to give up, right? That it's, it is a journey. And sometimes we forget what we actually achieved. And it's really important to document achievements along the way and to celebrate those achievements and to acknowledge the people who did that. Uh, we're also are very good at burning out our activists. Nothing worse than a burnt out activist. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They look really bad as well. <laughs> um, and it's really how do you sustain activism as a, as a way to sustain community. You never know when you actually need your activists and you never know when you need your researchers. So you need research all the time and I think you need activism all the time. Uh, I live in a community where you know, activism is a really dirty word. If you're called an activist, apparently it means all these negative things. But a friend of mine uh, who, who's recently passed was an activist. He said activists were the most mentally well people he ever knew because they were able to speak what was on their mind. They were able to demonstrate or show emotion that was genuine. Uh, they were not fearful of others. They were able to recognize and speak a truth that they believed in, so they didn't tell lies to themselves or others. Um, and they spoke things out. They didn't contain things inside them. They didn't let it burn and they didn't let it sort of rot and get ugly and negative. They got it out there. They said rotten things to other people, in other words. <laughs> uh, that, that would have been the way he, he would have expressed it. Uh, that it's really important to have both researchers doing what they need to do. And I mean, there's a great part of research which is not glamorous and not exciting. It's often doing some fairly serious thinking and serious engagement with ideas. Now, some people like me are turned on by that part of it. But I know a lot of my students think, do we, like, how long do we have to stay in a room for? Do we have to work at the computer for, you know, for so many hours because they would much rather be doing the exciting parts of research? Um, similarly with activism, I think once your world is activated, it's hard to go back to being passive. You can't ever do that. Uh, but it is important to kind of understand how struggle shifts, how rhetoric shifts, that political rhetoric of the 1970s is not the rhetoric 
of 2013. You know, that underneath that rhetoric, new complexities, a new discourse is called for, a new way of mobilising people. And, and that has to be worked on. Because I know, having worked with a number of conservatives, when they hear activists speak, they already pop them into their little box, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Um, so activists always have to come up with surprise. <laughs> All right, they have to surprise um, the other side. They have to dominate the discourse with new terms and new ways of framing the discourse. They have to be able to hone in on something worth winning, right? And, and that's, all, that's all tactical. And while they're doing that, I think researchers should be providing them with the evidence that they require to do that. That there is a good relationship really with research and activism. But researchers have to do that in a good way. There's nothing more embarrassing than to turn up with research that can get shot out of the ballpark because it doesn't work or doesn't stand up to its own rules. So research has to be good. It has to tell a powerful story. It has to be well done. It has to be ethical. It has to meet a lot of criteria. And community research can do all of that. So you can't shortcut it. And the other thing I haven't really talked about is it's really important to think things through, to be thoughtful. All right, sometimes the answers are in front of our nose and we might see it or we may not. And it's how to kind of understand that answer and figure out how to frame it, understand how to articulate it to communicate it to other people. It's often really simple. And so one of the dangers for researchers is that they can complicate it unnecessarily. Hmm. They can turn it into kind of long-winded, multi-syllabic, complicated sentences that really lost people on the first two words. <laughs> the message, if it's powerful, needs to be articulated in a simple way then you can back it up with the complexity later. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, did you want to? Sure. Um, sure. So, so I have homework assignments for you all. Um, so, and, and some are just mistakes I've made that you don't have to make. Um, but, but one element, I think, of research justice is a point I was trying to make in my earlier comments, which is, what does it mean to design research that reveals shared interests, shared fates, and solidarities? So what's it mean to do school-based research where you've got educators, parents, and students working together on a set of questions rather than splitting them off, right? Because if we split them off, we will evacuate that which is public. We can do research where parents are turned against teachers, teachers against parents and students. And so one big issue, I think, is that we need to think about research justice for solidarities. How do we do work with labor unions that's also about the reproductive needs of communities, right, and, and not split those off? The second is um, to not romanticize either the communities we're working with or our own work or the struggles. Um, when we were doing the work at, at the prison, we had all written sections of the final report, and I had written this piece that said something like, we're a group of women, some of us free, some in prison, we're all organized against violence, some of us have experienced violence, some of us have witnessed it, um, but we're against state violence and domestic violence, blah, 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 classic Michelle Fine. And Donna Hilton, one of the uh, women in prison who was on the research team said, you left out the part that some of us killed our kids. Mm. And she said, Michelle, if you leave that out, it just leaves a gaping hole for the right to fill it in. Could you please say that some of us have done things that we think about all the time with a terrible sense of remorse and responsibility and a desire to give back? And we've made some mistakes. 
So there's something in that that's really important about if there's a place you're scared to go to in the work, go to it and then figure out whether or not you want to do that publicly. But, but don't romanticize, don't leave those empty spaces because they will get filled in for you. The, the third thing I also said earlier is I think we can no longer just do critique. Mm -hmm. I think if we don't do imagination, uh, if we don't do imagination, no one will. And it's, it's not easy to imagine, um, but it feels to me like we have just hollowed and evacuated the sense that anything other than injustice is possible. And when you talk to young people, it feels like same old, same old, right? It's always been like this. Why would things be different? That is our work. Even if we are despairing, we have a responsibility to pry open the possibility of imagination. And a fourth issue is um, worry about um, your losses, but worry more about your victories because they're short-lived, right? So for those of us who have been around long enough, we have had some victories, whether they're policy victories or a campaign, it gets commodified in a hot second, right? So whether it's the small schools movement, I was involved in the small schools movement in New York, it was rich, it was vibrant, it was community generated, it was teacher generated, it was empowering, it was participatory. Gates Foundation walked by and said, that looks cool, let's make 250 of those in a Oakland next week, <laughs> right? So that participation, power, politics got ripped right out of it. Same thing with college and prison, Gates Foundation, they follow me around and turn things into <laughs> commodities. So they've heard college and prison's a good way to keep people out of college, so they now wanna put computers in all of these prisons to deliver a college curriculum. That is not what we meant, right? So the commodification of, po even as many mm -hmm. of us work in policy, just really watch it. Make sure that, because participation and, and politics are the first thing to go. And the last thing is occupy your universities, particularly the public universities. They have an obligation to do this work. I love what the data center is doing as a movement-based independent, but our universities need to be doing this work. The taxpayers pay my salary. If our research is not fed by and designed by them, then I am a fraud, and so occupy. Okay, I'm gonna ask Jalita to come up. Let me, before she comments, I wanna say something to everyone. Before you all like start moving and things like that, the teacher part's gonna come out. Please stay uh, because we actually are gonna honor the speakers and we actually, and just to forewarn you all, the program committee, actually, I'd like you all to come up here right now and sit right here in, in front on this. Yes, come up here, I see your face, Miho, don't be nervous, come up here. Jalita is gonna, if you're on the program committee, please come up here, that planned this event, you know who you are. Margaret, I'm calling you all, please come. Jalita's gonna share some words. It's an important part that we can't, we, we can't do this work if we don't also honor and respect that warrior spirit that puts in the time, the two speakers tonight, the people who planned and brought this together. It's important that we honor that work, and so please come on up. You can sit, because I know you're not gonna wanna stand there, so sit and pretend you're you know, in that classroom and you're just sitting family style. If you're on the program committee, if you're out in the hallway, come on over here. Um, and if you are doing something you can't move, wave your hand. But Jalita, please, uh, is going to share some words. And then we are going to have an honoring and a song by Desiree Harp, who has a beautiful voice. So please don't leave yet. Thank you. Aloha, ahi, ahi, kako. Aloha to everyone. Good evening. My name is Jill Nunokawa. And uh, I'm going to take just a few minutes. Um, first, uh, nui ha -a -ha -a -au. I am very, very humbled. Uh, to be here, to uh, be part of this closing. First, I want to give gratitude uh, to the ancestors of this land and to all the lands that you come from, your ancestors. They, not coincidentally, have brought us here tonight together in solidarity of what we do in our communities, who we are, where we come from, who we come from, and how we come together. So tonight, I'm grateful for all of them. Tonight was an example of not the usual symposium. It's not a usual lecture that we
we go to. This is an opening. It's an awakening. It's an opportunity to open our own hearts and minds to the possibilities, to the imagination of what research can do in our communities, how it can bring about social justice. I bring this up because I, unlike many other people, did matter in my family. I was raised by parents who loved me and who told me year in and year out when the standardized test told me that I was stupid, they told me I wasn't. When then I had nothing to give, they talked about multiple intelligence. That there are people in the community that know how to talk story. There's people in the community know how to throw net to weave, to do la'au lapa'au. There's people in the community that connect, that know all kinds of knowledge, and that I mattered. I took that forward, and I went to the university. I don't know how I got in, because my SAT scores combined were lower than my brother's verbal SAT score. But somehow I got into a university, and I figured out then and there that I had been lied to for my entire life that all the things in the books and the teachers telling me things that I didn't do well on the test, it's because there are so many lies, that because our voices were never heard, because our histories were never written. And in that, I moved forward and said, all right then, I'll move forward myself. I'll go to law school. That's a way to bring about social change. That's a way to articulate and advocate for my community. And I did that for many, many years as a public defender in four islands. I went around and I'd advocate and, and I talked about these people and why punitive is not restorative justice. And then after all those years and they changed the laws to be punitive on any amount of crystal methamphetamine, automatic jail, an open five-year term. So the poorest of poor, my clientele, were ending up in jails simply because they had possession of a residue in a pipe in a public park after 10 p.m. And so I couldn't do social justice by doing a case by one case after another. So I moved to the University of Hawaii thinking that area, the academics, the academy was the place to bring about social justice. I thought maybe better than a public defender one case at a time. Meanwhile, I worked in the community, in the Native Hawaiian community, who worked the United Nations, my friends worked on the draft declaration. We worked at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. We worked and we worked and we worked in our community. And our work got some places, you know, we, we, we celebrate the victories, but we sustained the defeats. And as my very good friend Mililani Trask would say, our biggest enemy is our own despairing heart. How we have absorbed loss after loss defeat after defeat. And then one day, a few years ago, my friend Rachel Pfeffer introduced me to Miho Kim. And Miho Kim came to Hawaii, and she gave a training with the Hawaii People's Fund. And I watched a video of it, and it's changed my life. Because although I've committed my life to social justice in Hawaii for 30 years, although I've worked from shore to shore, anywhere from Hawaii, to New York, to Geneva, in our communities on women's issues, on environmental justice issues. It doesn't matter because the commonality, the solidarity, is that it's all about social justice, to make visible the invisible, voices of the, those who have been quieted and silenced. And so now it's a time in my heart while I come before you to say, I support the data center. I've done research on what they do, the importance of their work, the fact that I don't have a data center in Hawaii. And what we do in Hawaii also ripples in the Pacific Basin. And so at this point, I say, I've heard so much wonderful wisdom here tonight, and mahalo nui loa for all of your wise words, for your successes, and for enduring the defeats. And it's a time now, you know, when we try to encourage the young people. I can't encourage them with my own burnout, 
When Linda talks about burnout, I can't go to you folks and honestly say that I haven't been burnt out in the process. I have. And this is the lesson for tonight. I find that data center uplifts me. I find them as a possibility of positive change, a, a fundamental change in the grid of knowledge, the knowledge that we haven't been part of the grid. We couldn't hook up our stories and tell and empower each other and empower our communities. It's time now for a new power, a new knowledge grid, a shift in way the status quo has been, where we all can hook up to this. And it is the vision, it is the vision, data center's vision of a sustainable grid of knowledge and connectivity. And they serve a complementary connector role. And so it is going to be my, uh, uh, indeed, great pleasure to invite data center to work with them, to work in my communities, to train community members to do their own research, to imagine what is possible, and then go forth and attain it to actualize positive, productive, and progressive change. And so tonight, my commitment to the data center, to those who went before us, to us in this defining moment of history, in our lives, to be committed. What does that mean? There's so many possibilities of what commitment and solidarity means. For me tonight, it means open up. I got this cute little thing, um, program, program. And in it, I read it, it's very nice, nice pictures, nice pictures, everyone. And then in it, there's a, a basic, you know, a survey. You know, we think survey, usually I throw them away. But tonight, there's actually a purpose in it. So we would really appreciate if you could do that as, as a step of just simply, was this important? Did it have any resonance, meaning, value? The other thing is there's this little envelope. You know, and I was telling my friends that, that for me, it's sort of a first, and, and I'll share this with you. I don't ask for anything, actually, but things come into my lap, and, and I was telling Rachel the other day, two things came in my lap, and the first one was, I, I was working on Maui as a public defender, and I had a juror who came to me, and he said, I really like you. This is true. I really like you, and so I'm going to give you the inside scoops about the future. It's called cellular phones. And if you come in with stock with me, you're going to be filthy rich. I told him, I don't date jurors, and I don't do things that are never going to be. <laughs> okay, that's the first. Second, I had another community member come up to me and said, Jill, the wave of the future is online shopping. And I have stocks for you. And I said, I, nobody's going to do online shopping. We all go out shopping. You go in person. It's kind of sort of a relationship thing. Uh, so I didn't buy stock in online shopping. So now, after I made those two mistakes, I, I, I usually, this is true, I usually really don't give. I mean, I give in my time. I give in my own resources, my money to my specific community work I do. And believe me, I give. I give in parking tickets when I'm testifying at the legislature. I give in food <laughs> when the community comes together. I give and I give and I give. And I usually don't give um, to outside um, organizations. That's just the truth. But I don't want it to be three strikes on this one. I don't want to miss out on cellular phones. I missed out on online shopping, but I'm not going to miss out in donating to the data center. <laughs> and let me tell you why. I really think we're on the cusp of something really exciting, a really shift in the way we, we generate, produce, share, and find solidarity in research. Research is a dirty word. In my background, it was used against me when I went for tenure because what I shared with them was anecdotal in nature and not data-driven. So I've learned all about that research. So in the names of those who went before me, four people, tonight I'm going to talk, just mention Kimo Campbell, Janet McLeod, Ingrid Washawanatak, and Neelak Butler. In their names, $5 each, I'm going to donate $20. If you would like to join me in donating tonight in the memories of the names of people that went before you that have so much meaning and significance in your life, then I encourage you to give. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be a sustainer. I'm going to get my little credit card out, and I'm going to give every month. 
because I find this to be such a good feeling. I could give, and I have, to many bars and many restaurants in my life. <laughs> we all have, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. However, tonight, I give my money in something that will build. It will build my capacity. It will build me. It will feed my soul. Instead of times of despair, times that my heart were dis was despaired, times that I turn to self-destructive behavior and I paid money for it. Tonight I encourage you to be self-constructive, to be part of a movement. And like we said, it's more than kue. It's more than just to resist. It is holomua. We are to move forward together. That is how we're gonna bring about social justice. So thank you for your time for your consideration of donation, and for your commitment to be part of this movement towards social justice. Mahalo nui loa. Ikali kame inoma no te'e onatsatis a timit o yake. Hiaka, I just wanted to say thank you. My name is Desiree. I come from the Mishuwa Wapo tribe, and I'm going to be singing two songs for you today. I also come from the Dene tribe, and so I'm going to be singing two songs for you. And thank you so much to the speakers. It's such an honor to be here, and Hiaka. <laughs>
Uh, thank you, everyone. I think we're going to do a book signing in a few minutes. So if you want to come and shake the speaker's hands, uh, get a copy of the books. There's still some in the lobby if you don't have one. I think it's going to be in here, yes? The book signing will be right here. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Wow.